Greetings to all of you who have joined us for today's presentation. My name is Jim Colhane, and I am the current chair of the History of Pharmacy Special Interest Group. On behalf of the SIG leadership, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all who have joined us today. The next two years are important milestones for the profession of pharmacy. This year, we celebrate the bicentennial of the United States Pharmacopeia. Founded in 1820, this important organization and publication served as a critical change agent, ushering in the era of standardized medicine. We congratulate all of you who work to continue to update and publish this important publication. Next year, we are celebrating the bicentennial of the first school of pharmacy, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, the establishment of which had immense and lasting impact on the profession. I would like to extend my personal congratulations to Dean Ed Foote and his faculty for this milestone and for continuing the legacy of leadership and excellence established nearly 200 years ago. I can think of no better person to help us to celebrate these important milestones than our speaker today, Dr. Greg Higby. Dr. Higby earned a BS in pharmacy degree from the University of Michigan in 1977. After nine months in practice as a pharmacist, he returned to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he received his master's in pharmacy in 1980 and a PhD in pharmacy in 1984. He did his graduate work in the history of pharmacy under noted historian Glenn Sonnedecker. From 1984 to 86, he served as a research associate at the University of Wisconsin, teaching the then required history of pharmacy course and serving as the assistant director of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. Founded in 1941 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Institute serves as America's Pharmacy Historical Society. Between 1986 and 1988, he served as the associate director, acting director, and full-time executive director of the Institute. In this capacity, he served as editor of Pharmacy and History, the quarterly journal of the Institute. Greg retired as executive director of the AIHP at the end of 2018 after over 30 years of service and assumed his new position as Fischella's Scholar. In this new part-time role, Greg curates the Institute's collection of reference materials, books, and artifacts. He also continues to teach the pharmacy history course at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Pharmacy, as well as serving as senior curator at the school. The title of Greg's talk, 500 Days That Shaped the Future of Pharmacy in the United States explores the events that led to the establishment of the United States Pharmacopeia and the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Greg Higby. Thanks, Jim, for that introduction. Here's my title slide. 500 Days That Shape the Future of Pharmacy in the United States. Just a little housekeeping to go through. Here's a conflict of interest slide. Learning objectives properly edited and put in, in, in proper form by the staff at AACP. Thanks a lot. Active learning. During my introduction, please write down or consider three things that you know about the early history of the United States Pharmacopeia or the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. We'll come back to this at the end. So 44 years ago, in 1976, the United States celebrated its bicentennial with parades, books, exhibitions, and television specials. A wave of historical interest swept the country. The profession of pharmacy in the United States is now in the midst of celebrating a bicentennial of its own. 200 years ago, two small groups of men met, separated by 140 miles and 478 days, and founded two of the most important institutions of American pharmacy, the United States Pharmacopeia and the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. While different in origins and composition, these two institutions soon intertwined and influenced the progress of American pharmacy. The 500 days of my title span the time between December 1819 
when a dozen physicians set off from their homes in New York, Baltimore, New Haven, Philadelphia, and rural Georgia on the journey to Washington City and the U.S. Capitol to, in, to convene the first national medical convention in American history. And late 1821, when the April 1821, when the first school of pharmacy in the United States was established in Philadelphia. Both events occurred in response to changes in American society and healthcare in the early days of the Republic. So let's reflect a bit on American pharmacy 200 years ago. In 1819, there was neither a national pharmacopoeia nor any other book recognized as a national standard for defining drugs and their preparations. In 1819, there existed no association of pharmacists anywhere in the United States. In 1819, no formal school of pharmacy operated in the nation. By late 1821, there would be a National Pharmacopeia, an association of apothecaries in Philadelphia, which, soon after its establishment, set up a school of pharmacy for apprentices. On these three pillars, young leaders of pharmacy built an emerging profession. Before looking directly at the changes that occurred in 1820 and 1821, I want to set the scene in brief. What was the state of American pharmacy at the beginning of the 1800s? Most importantly, physicians dispensed most of the medicines they prescribed from bags or chests they carried on their rounds. Trained usually through apprenticeship, physicians learned rudimentary pharmacy by compounding medicines for their preceptors from ingredients purchased from wholesale druggists or from apothecaries. A small minority of physicians who had attended formal medical school and hospital rounds learned less pharmacy and sometimes wrote out prescriptions uh, for filling by apothecaries. Druggists were central figures in the 19th century drug supply chain. These wholesalers purchased drugs, preparations, patent medicines, and various sundries from import merchants, repackaged or processed them for sale to general stores, physicians, ship owners, apothecaries, plantation owners, and the general public. Located in larger Atlantic coast cities like Philadelphia, druggists were prosperous in the young republic. As was the case throughout the 19th century, the lines between practitioners in the pharmaceutical enterprise were fuzzy at best. These pages from an early Philadelphia business directory seem to show that druggists on the right outnumbered apothecaries on the left. If we look a little closer, we can see that several of the apothecaries, those who operated a small shop, also listed themselves as druggists, selling bulk drugs, chemicals, and other supplies to general stores, physicians, and others. Again, this trade was unregulated. And the list of druggists included those who sold their own remedies in large quantities, including one Dr. Benjamin Rush. I've highlighted Dr. Rush not only because of his prominence as a signer of the Declaration of Independence, but because his listing as a druggist illustrates the complex and fluid nature of medical and pharmaceutical practice in the early 1800s. Trained in Edinburgh, Rush was one of the most famous American physicians of his era, especially noted as an advocate for, of so-called heroic therapy. As a druggist, Rush sold thousands of his famed thunderbolts, which combined the strong laxatives mercurous chloride or calomel with jalap. Small in numbers were the apothecaries, filling occasional prescription, more commonly compounding recipes for family curers or making preparations for later dispensing by physicians. Apothecaries ran a small shop with a generally ex expected collection of merchandise including soaps, brushes, flavorings, spices, 
sponges, oils, and patent medicines, usually British in origin. Like their English counterparts, American apothecaries often treated minor ailments over the counter, a practice called countered prescribing. There are no effective laws regulating these occupations, and men moved freely between them. Men like druggist Thomas Dyad called themselves doctor without any credentials, and happily ran an apothecary shop at the corner of his massive cheap drug medicines and chemical store. In the laboratories of druggists and apothecary shops, preparations were made following formulas from a wide variety of sources. Because there were no recognized American pharmacopoeias at the time, America, in the early 1800s that is, apothecaries and druggists referred to dispensatories, detailed commentaries on foreign pharmacopoeias. Especially popular were various editions from Edinburgh. In their discussion of popular remedies, dispensatories often combined recipes from different pharmacopoeias published by different nations or even city-states. This practice led to serious therapeutic confusion, especially with regards to potent medicines such as tincture of opium or laudanum. Now, several editions of the Edinburgh New Dispensatory were pirated, that is, published by American printers without permission. One edition of the Edinburgh Dispensatory was adapted, that is, copied and rearranged alphabetically by Philadelphia physician and professor John Redmond Cox. And this book was titled The American Dispensatory, first published in 1806. Now Cox, a supremely confident fellow, suggested that his new book might be generally adopted as a national standard. This was unlikely, however, because as a rearranged edition of the Edinburgh Dispensatory, Cox's book paid little attention to the botanical drugs of North America, a matter of significant pride among physicians in the United States. The first significant step toward a national pharmacopoeia took place in Boston on October 3, 1805, when the Massachusetts Medical Society decided that a state pharmacopoeia was necessary, quote, to secure a uniform mode of compounding medicines. Now today, pharmacopoeias represent an effort to ensure the quality of medicines. 200 years ago, the focus was on selecting the most valuable drugs from the hundreds available and indicating the best preparations of them with concise names. We can see that in the preface of the Massachusetts Pharmacopoeia. It is the intention of a pharmacopoeia to point out those articles whose properties entitle them to be employed for the cure of diseases with the best modes of preparing them and to supply the preparations of them with titles or names by which they be, may be known without constantly repeating a description of their ingredients. And the purpose of a pharmacopoeia is also outlined in this preface practice had changed. Physicians were writing out more prescriptions, especially in cities and towns, for apothecaries to compound and dispense. Between them, quote, a perfect understanding should exist. As this cannot be established between them as individuals, it is necessary that there should be uniformity, both in the pharmaceutical preparations and language, unquote. The Massachusetts Society sent out copies of the pharmacopoeia to other state medical associations, inviting them to adopt it as their national standard, perhaps even serving eventually as a sort of national authority. The New Hampshire Society was alone in adopting it. The Medical Society of North Carolina agreed that a national pharmacopoeia was a desideratum, but argued that a truly nationwide effort was required. Physicians at the time saw great differences between diseases and their treatments in various parts of the nation. Medical practices were viewed as sectional, diverging especially between North and South. A national pharmacopoeia required a truly national plan, and that came from a unique partnership. In 
Historian Glenn Sonnedecker wrote that, quote, more than anyone else, Lyman Spaulding was responsible for the successful planning and work that produced the first pharmacopoeia of the United States. Born in Cornish, New Hampshire in 1775, Spaulding graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1797. After stints of teaching chemistry at Dartmouth and practicing medicine in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Spaulding made his way to New York City in 1812. There, he developed a close collegial relationship with Samuel Latham Mitchell, a famed physician, editor, writer, and politician. Born on a Long Island farm, Mitchell apprenticed as a physician with his uncle, then traveled to Edinburgh to obtain his medical degree, returning home to New York in 1786. Inquisitive and ambitious, he served in the New York legislature then both houses of the U.S. Congress. An enthusiastic booster of the young nation, he supported the idea of national pharmacopoeia as a way to demonstrate American progress to the wider world. Moreover, it would inform European physicians of the benefits of North American Materia Medica. Because of his political, editorial, and scientific pro uh, prowess, Mitchell was sometimes called the New Franklin. On January 6, 1817, Spaulding took the floor at a meeting of the New York County Medical Society and outlined his proposal for a national pharmacopoeia. Four sectional conventions of physicians would develop a list of drugs and preparations as, we, as well as choose delegates to a national convention to be held in Washington City the 1st of January, 1820. The county society approved the plan and authorized Spaulding to obtain approval from the State Medical Society. In early 1818, the State Medical Society of New York approved the plan. And then soon afterwards, letters were sent out above Spaulding's signature to all the medical societies and schools in the U.S. inviting their participation. Now, enough positive responses went out that in November 1818, Another circular was sent out arranging for the actual district conventions in Boston, Philadelphia, Columbia, South Carolina, and Lexington, Kentucky. On June 1st, 1819, three of the four district conventions took place. In the West, no meeting occurred. The North and Middle District conventions composed draft pharmacopoeias and selected delegates. The scene was set for January 1820 in Washington City. Visitors to the U.S. Capitol today may marvel at the small size of what we call the old Senate chamber. When the National Medical Convention gathered on January 1, 1820, the Senate was made up of 44 senators representing 22 states, 11 slave, 11 free. In just a few weeks, this would be the scene of the historic Missouri Compromise. The room was certainly large enough for the half dozen men who arrived on a cold morning to establish the U.S. Pharmacopeia. Called to order by Spaulding, they briefly discussed the merits of the two district pharmacopeias and adjourned to meet two days later on May, on Monday, excuse me, January 3rd, hoping that more men would arrive. Now here's Robert Tom's vision of the, the January 3rd uh, session. With a majority of 11 of the elected 16 delegates in attendance, Mitchell was elected as chair. In addition to the primary action of comparing draft pharmacopoeias, the convention took two important steps. First, it mandated regular revisions of the pharmacopoeia every 10 years, and it selected a committee of publication chaired by Spaulding, which included Harvard professor Jacob Bigelow. Even though Bigelow was not in attendance at the convention, he would eventually shepherd the first USP to final publication in December of 1820. Now the social media of the day, newspapers, carried a variety of reports. The first report on the convention was exuberant and carefully avoided mention of the small number of delegates. It stated, 
The fields, the mountains, and forests of North America abound with vegetable productions that possess the power to relieve the inhabitants from disease. Many of these are peculiar to our country and adapted to our wants. They are so rich, diversified, and efficacious for the promotion of health that there is no necessity of importing many from foreign countries. Instead of conflicting pharmacopoeias, which disfigure the several governments of Europe, the citizens of the United States have the prospect of a professional manual for the introduction on a standard that shall extend over all the space between Canada and Mexico. Now, I suspect that the irrepressible Mitchell may have provided this copy for reporters. If you pick up the, a copy of the first USP, you'll see that every monograph, as we call them now, is on two pages, the left in Latin, the right in English. While the Massachusetts Pharmacopeia was all in English, supposedly because of the lack of Latin among American apothecaries, the USP was in both languages. The Latin was there by tradition and for the use of foreign-born physicians in the United States whose English might be weak. The English was there, again, for the ignorant apothecaries and, of course, for the vast majority of American physicians who knew very little Latin. As you turn the pages, you will not find several aspects of modern pharmacopoeias. There are no chemical formulas, no assays, no purity rubrics. Again, the purpose was to create a perfect understanding between physicians and apothecaries and bring uniformity to therapeutics. And the first USP did accomplish this imperfect goal. Despite its shortcomings, it helped put American medicine on the map internationally and supported the use of American Materia Medica. It directed apothecaries to stock certain items and how to make preparations, thereby directly influencing daily pharmacy practice. And the provision for regular revisions, one of the greatest innovations of the USP, promised that future editions would be better. Soon after the delegates to the National Medical Convention returned home from the Capitol to their regular practices and started working on the future pharmacopoeia, an old friend of ours, John Redmond Cox, announced a new scheme to improve pharmacy practice in his home city of Philadelphia. As you recall, 15 years before, he had proposed that his book, The American Dispensatory, serve as a pharmacopoeia for the young nation. Now he put forward a plan to the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania for that institution to grant degrees in pharmacy. In order to receive the degree, students would be required to attend two courses of lectures, possess three years of practical experience in the pharmacy, and practice and pass examinations in chemistry and materia medica. In order to recognize prominent druggists and apothecaries already practicing, Cox's plan called for the awarding of honorary Master of Pharmacy diplomas from the University of Pennsylvania. When Cox formally presented his plan to the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, he claimed that his motivation was improvement of public health. The diplomas would indicate competency in the making of medicines. The University of Pennsylvania, in his view, had to act because no society of apothecaries existed in the United States, let alone Philadelphia, to regulate their occupation as was taking place in Europe at the time. That assertion may have been a mistake because just four days after the University of Pennsylvania of Trustees published a notice about the new program, a meeting of angry Philadelphia druggists and apothecaries gathered in Carpenter's Hall and took the first steps to change the situation. Reaction in the popular press appeared quickly as well, criticizing the motivations of Cox, claiming that he put forward his plan as a scheme to increase his income as a teacher. At the time, professors were paid via course tickets. 
Popular professors, of course, had more students, sold more tickets, had more income. Letters to newspapers claimed that Cox wanted to force apothecaries to take his courses and then pay some other fees for the purpose of enriching himself. Cox and officials at the University of Pennsylvania were surprised by the harsh reaction to the plan. Apothecaries complained that economic times are difficult in their trade with a surplus of shops. The fees to attend the courses and pay for the final diploma seemed excessive. They rejected the idea that physicians alone should examine the pharmacy degree candidates. Those familiar with Cox pointed out again his poor reputation as a teacher. Wholesale druggists were especially opposed to the idea that instruction would take place during the day when their apprentices worked. And a few alumni of the University of Pennsylvania objected to the idea of the university awarding this first set of Master of Pharmacy diplomas to men who had not actually attended any lectures at the university. Two young apothecaries, Peter Lehman, age 34, and Henry Troth, 27, met and decided to organize a gathering of apothecaries and druggists. Now, they agreed with Cox's general contention that the drug trade and its practitioners needed improvement, perhaps through lectures, shop inspections, a code of conduct. They believed, however, that these activities had to be accomplished by the apothecaries and druggists themselves, not by physicians. And so they went about Philadelphia in February 1821 and invited, <coughs> and invited their competitors and colleagues to gather on the evening of the 23rd of February, 1821. The meeting of apothecaries and druggists took place in historic Carpenters Hall on Chestnut Street, where the first Continental Congress had assembled in, the eight, in, excuse me, in 1774. Built by the Carpenters Company, the hall was a common meeting place for groups in the city for decades. Here is painter, Rob, painter Robert Tom's imagined view of the event of 23rd February, 1821. Contemporary accounts state that the discussion was spirited. Some in attendance were in difficult position as they had endorsed Cox's plan earlier. The group appointed a committee of nine led by Troth to devise an alternative plan to that of Cox and the University of Pennsylvania. As pharmacist historian Charles the Wall observed, this was an enterprise of youth with 28 as the average age of the committee members. This group, the committee, agreed with the assessment of Cox and the Penn Medical faculty that the quality of products on all levels of the drug trade had declined. And so they put forward their own plan at a meeting on March 13th, 1821. The Troth Committee proposed the establishment of a college of apothecaries, the attention of which will be constantly directed to the quality of articles brought into the drug market in which information is beneficial and interesting to the trade communicated, as well as the subsequent establishment of a school, quote, in which lectures designed especially for the instruction of druggists and apothecaries should be delivered. Now, the 68 men in attendance, roughly half the members of the trade in Greater Philadelphia, approved and signed the Constitution creating the Philadelphia College of Apothecaries. They called their organization a college following a long tradition in the, in the English-speaking world and emulating the local medical society, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. The new local society would hold quarterly meetings featuring scientific papers, establish a school to educate apprentices, appoint a committee of inspection, and have the right to expel any member dealing in poor quality medicines. The preamble of the Constitution stressed the key importance of drug quality. And you see here the quotation, which I won't read out loud.
On March 27th, 1821, the College of Apothecaries renamed the, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy a year later when they were incorporated by the Pennsylvania legislature, held its first official meeting again at Carpenter's Hall. The work in this way, one could date if you wanted to, the work of official organized pharmacy in the United States from this date. Now at that first meeting, the, the, the members formally approved the idea of creating a school of pharmacy. And on April 23rd, 1821, the college trustees announced the selection of the professors for the new school. Dr. Samuel Jackson and Gerard Troosts were selected as professors. Now I've chosen this date for the founding of the school because of the nature of education at the time. As mentioned, professors obtained their pay from the sale of lecture tickets and the sponsoring institution in this case, the College of Apothecaries, did little more than arrange for a lecture hall plus a minimum of demonstration materials. For their new school, the college leased space at the Hall of the German Society of Pennsylvania, excuse me, of Philadelphia, for $200 a year. The lectures began in early November 1821. Jackson and Truce were clearly qualified to teach their subjects. Jackson was the son of a physician apothecary and, and had received his M.D. degree from Penn in 1809. Troost, a native of Holland, was educated both as a, as a physician and as a pharmacist. <coughs> Excuse me. For both, their position with the school was short-lived and a stepping stone to long-term positions elsewhere. Jackson returned to Penn in 1827, eventually becoming professor of medicine a chair he held until 1863. Troost only lasted a year at PCP as students complained about his very heavy Dutch accent. Troost eventually made his way to Nashville where he became a professor of mineralogy and the Tennessee state geologist. Here is a modest newspaper notice that documents the beginning of formal pharmacy education in the United States. And I've blown it up for you. The story of the replacements for Jackson and Troost ties together the three great institutions founded 200 years ago. United States Pharmacopeia, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and its School of Pharmacy with the creation of the American Pharmacists Association 30 years later. Eventually, the professorships of chemistry and material medical at PCP were filled by Franklin Bache and George B. Wood, respectively. During the revision of the United States Pharmacopoeia in 1830, Wood and Bache took over the process in Philadelphia, enlisting help from trusted apothecaries and brought a high level of rigor to the first revision. In 1833, they composed the Dispensatory of the United States of America based on this revised USP. This new compendium became the most influential therapeutic guide of the 19th century and solidified the position of the United States Pharmacopeia as the national standard. They soon left the School of Pharmacy for other faculty positions, but Wood and Beige kept their connection with the College of Pharmacy through relationships with Daniel B. Smith, president of the college for many years, and William Proctor, the school's first professor of pharmacy. Again, PCP was both the first pharmacy association in the United States as well as the first School of Pharmacy and other local societies arose in major cities in subsequent years following the model of PCP. They functioned largely as trade associations and attempted to reduce crushing competition and attempted to shorten hours, which for a one-man store were typically 12 hours a day, six days a week. Now some of these societies succeeded in opening schools for apprentices, but 
almost all of them struggled to keep up with Philadelphia throughout most of the 1800s. Now I can spend the whole hour uh, outlining the early achievements of PCP as a local society. The School for Apprentices is the most obvious on a local level, but other developments had national impact. The Committee on the Pharmacopeia had direct access to Wood and Beach, the primary revisers of the USP for decades. So impressed were these physicians involved that they invited pharmacy societies to send delegates to the 1850 USP convention and added William Proctor to the Committee of Publication and Revision. From the 1820s on, PCP held quarterly meetings that centered on scientific paper sessions. PCP corresponded with other learned pharmacy groups internationally and established a committee to inspect apothecary shops for cleanliness and professional conduct. As a scientific society, the Philadelphians published the American Journal of Pharmacy, the first pharmacy journal in the English language and very influential, especially for, ad for advocating for for the science of pharmacy uh, in the United States. Now, as pharmacy educators, we are most interested, of in course, in the college's School of Pharmacy. At first, two sets of night courses were established in the subjects of chemistry and materia medica. Apprentices worked all day in the shops and wholesalers, then attended lectures at night. To obtain a diploma, the students had to attend the lectures twice that is the same lectures over again, and write a thesis. Lectures in pharmacy did not occur until William Proctor started teaching them in 1846. Now you can probably ask, why no pharmacy for the first 25 years of a pharmacy school? Well, because pharmacy was regarded as more an art than science and a practical skill best learned through apprenticeship. In the beginning, physicians were the faculty as they were the most commonly educated individuals in the time in the subjects of chemistry and materia medica. Now, I want to end my talk today by tying together the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, the United States Pharmacopeia, and the founding of the American Pharmaceutical Association, the wellspring for many of today's pharmacy organizations and institutions. When PCP and other local pharmacy societies began in the 1820s and 30s, they were very much encouraged by the medical profession. Physicians wanted apothecaries to handle the new potent alkaloidal and other chemical med medicines that were gaining in popularity. Many physicians who had been practicing medicine and pharmacy together out of a shop, similar to the English apothecaries of the previous century, were selling out to their, uh, their businesses, to their apprentices, apothecary apprentices. However, by the 1840s, relations took a turn. New medical schools were gradu graduating too many physicians, some of whom opened up doctor shops in competition with pharmacists, who felt obligated to practice medicine over the counter in return. Most importantly, the quality of crude drugs in the marketplace declined greatly during the 1840s. Most crude drugs in the U.S. were imported through London. In 1848, the esteemed British apothecary Jacob Bell wrote an article lamenting the poor quality of drugs exported to the former colonies. He stated that in many cases, unethical wholesalers extracted active ingredients from crude barks and leaves. Then they repackaged the exhausted material as good. Oft times, the, res the resultant weak drugs were labeled good enough for America. Now, this situation did not go unnoticed in the United States during the 1840s. A port inspector, Dr. M.J. Bailey, issued reports on <clears throat> tons of imported drugs that he had rejected, pointing out common adulteration, uh, that is, sawdust or powder of post, as it was commonly called, added to ground drugs, substitution of inferior articles, and again, attempts to bring in exhausted cinchona bark into the country. 
Working with the College of Pharmacy of the City of New York, Bailey attempted to get congressional action. At the same time, medical surgeons in the West attending patients during the Mexican War noticed that their old standard drug treatments did not work. By this they meant that the strong laxatives and strong emetics of the era had little effect on their soldier patients. Dennis Worthen has written an excellent piece documenting the rise and fall of the Drug Import Act of 1848 and the roles of medical and pharmaceutical societies in its passage. This first federal law had initial success through a system of port inspectors. But when political cronyism led to the appointment of incompetent or corrupt inspectors, its effectiveness declined. Unfortunately, concerned citizens or customers were hindered, hindered by the lack of direct, concrete standards in the United States pharmacopoeia for any botanical drug, including opium or cinchona bark. Here's the entry for opium. Just a simple description, without purity or potency remarks. What were desperately needed were definitive positive standards. For example, a minimum percentage of morphine in opium to permit importation into the U.S. Druggists and apothecaries in the New York City area bore much of the brunt of complaints about the decline in quality, even though they had little power to change the importation situation. The New York College of Pharmacy appointed a commission to address the issue and empowered one of its members, Charles Guthrie, a physician and wholesaler, to bring a set of positive standards <coughs> from the college to the May 1851 AMA meeting. The AMA did not act on this list, but instead instructed Guthrie to organize a national convention of apothecaries and druggists to draw up a set of standards. So Guthrie returned to the task quickly. He issued a call for a national convention of pharmaceutists and druggists to take place in New York City on October 15, 1851. The various colleges of pharmacy across the nation were, were invited to send delegations of three to the convention to draw up standards for inspectors and the consideration of, quote, the proposal of any measures that might be calculated to elevate the profession and to promote their interest throughout the country. Now, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy uh, considered this uh, issue, and they chose Edward Parrish and William Proctor, Jr. as their delegates, two of the most articulate and influential writers in the history of American pharmacy. Proctor, the editor of the American Journal of Pharmacy, published Guthrie's call and supported the convention and its purpose in a series of editorials. He and Parrish together had decided to go to New York and there push for the creation of a national pharmaceutical association. In response to Guthrie's call, delegations arrived on Wall Street in New York City from Philadelphia and Boston with letters coming in from the absent delegations from Cincinnati and Baltimore. A committee of three headed by Proctor was appointed to draw up the business of the convention, which had been adjourned for the evening. The Proctor committee worked long into the night on a report addressing the principal issue of the convention, that is the standards for imported drugs and the Philadelphia proposal of a national organization. The next morning, Proctor read the committee report to the small group of convention attendees, and it was considered in sections with full, deliberate, and very interesting discussion. Now, some of the resolutions on, on standards are direct and modern sounding. For example, opium should not contain less than 8% pure morphine. With the announced proposal of the convention achieved, the group moved on to the second set of resolutions offered by Proctor's committee. These concerned the establishment of a national association. Resolved that a convention be called. 
consisting of three delegates each from incorporated and unincorporated pharmaceutical societies to meet at Philadelphia on the first Wednesday of October, 1852, when all the important questions bearing on the profession may be considered and measures adopted for the organization of a national association to meet every year, unquote. The resolution passed, and when Parrish and Proctor returned to Philadelphia, they began advocating very strongly for the meeting. Thus, the founding of the American Pharmaceutical Association in 1852 and all the organizations that sprang from it have roots in that first American pharmacy society, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and as well, in an indirect way, it's in its allied institution, the United States Pharmacopeia Convention. These roots are reflected in the founding principles of APHA in 1852, improvement in the quality of drugs and medicines, improved interprofessional relations, scientific enlightenment and improvement, and the education and training of future pharmacists. And as I also mentioned there, suppressing quackery, that is empiricism. In Robert Tom's illustration of the founding of APHA in 1852, he places Daniel B. Smith, the fellow with the white hair, at the left end of the table. Those gathered selected him as the first president of the new national organization. Smith had been a founder of the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy in 1821 and had served as its first secretary. At this point, uh, he was the president of the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. Among his diverse civic and intellectual activities, Smith served as professor of ethics at Haverford College. It should be no surprise then that one of the first actions of the new association under his leadership was the adoption of a code of ethics for the American Pharmaceutical Association. The very first article of that code stated, as the practice of pharmacy can only become uniform by the adoption of the National Pharmacopeia as a guide in the preparation of official medicines, the members of this association agree to uphold the use of the pharmacopoeia in their practice. So in summary, how did those 500 days shape American pharmacy? Well, more than just the book, the United States Pharmacopoeia became a national institution of public health with regular conventions and a set schedule of revisions. Through its connections with the United States Dispensatory, the USP guided therapeutics throughout the 1800s. It set the standard for what drugs and preparations should be stocked in pharmacies. As the century progressed, the USP became a focus of scientific inquiry and professional pride. Students at schools of pharmacy, like my father, memorized its pages and learned its formulae. State boards of pharmacy tested applicants on its preparations. After 1906, the USP has been an official national standard for medicinal quality. And for the modern multinational pharmaceutical industry, it is the most important standard for strength and purity. More than just a school of pharmacy and allied professions, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy had a profound impact on the profession, especially in the formative years of the 1800s. As an active and vibrant local pharmacist society, it served as a model for future societies from Boston to San Francisco. Its school educated the elite of the profession for decades and again served as a model for local schools in Boston, New York, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Chicago, and elsewhere. The Journal of the College, the American Journal of Pharmacy, played a key role in encouraging pharmacists to expand the scientific and professional side of their careers. And just as I said before, the college was instrumental in the establishment of the American Pharmacists Association, as well as several subsequent organizations and institutions. So I encourage you to inform your students and colleagues about American Pharmacy's Bicentennial and the foundation set down 
200 years ago by the USP and the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. I appreciate your attention and welcome your questions. There's my email address. I want to thank my home institutions, the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Pharmacy and the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. As always, I have to give a pitch. Please consider joining the Institute. Go to the website AIHP.org. And I'm afraid to say now is the time to take your medicine. It's time for active learning. Please review the three things that you wrote down at the start of the lecture or didn't uh, regarding the history of USP and PCP. Correct any, any errors you might have had there. Um, and then, you know, I'll perhaps write down three things from this lecture, some takeaways that you might use in your own instruction. So I just wanted to say thanks again for listening, and I look forward to seeing you all next year um, at uh, AACP 2021. Bye for now.